to Six Strings and Things, a guitar adventure. The place for all things guitar and gear. Here are your hosts, Chris, Jesse, and Robert. Welcome to Six Strings and Things, a guitar adventure, your fortnightly webcast for all things guitar and gear. I'm Chris, and with me tonight is Jesse. Hello. And tonight, Robert is working, so it's just going to be Jesse and myself flying kind of solo. The cat is away, the mice will play. That's right, so we'll <laughs> see. So if this, if this show is terrible, it's totally Robert's fault uh, <laughs> for not being here, keeping us under control. That's right. That's right. So uh, let's go ahead and get started with our normal uh, order of things. What have you been doing this week, Jesse, uh, guitar-wise? It's been a busy week, so mostly my guitar has been just occasional noodling, uh, old stuff that I've done a million times. So unfortunately, I haven't really progressed much this week. Well, it was more therapy than study. <laughs> yeah, that's not a bad thing. I mean, there's definitely weeks where the guitar is therapy, and it's a hell of a lot cheaper than a shrink. It's true. That you know? is true. Yeah. Uh, I've had a rather busy guitar week because I've had a less than busy professional week. Um, so I've been uh, spent the weekend teaching myself how to play Killing Floor. Um, the Howlin' Wolf tune. Excellent. It's Howlin' Wolf. Yeah. And, uh, you know, YouTube video, basically, I just searched how to play Killing Floor. And uh, first one came up. It started a little rocky. And I thought, no, I'll give it a shot. And the guy played, and he showed his left hand pretty good. Um, but the right hand, it was kind of hard to tie to really listen carefully for what the rhythm was. And honestly, that probably did me a lot of good. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, I couldn't cheat and look at some kind of, you know, up-down notation on a tab somewhere and not think about what I was doing. Right. So I was – but I was pretty happy. I was able to get through um, the the important parts of the song in uh, just a couple of hours, to be honest with you. Excellent. Yeah, I was pretty happy with that. And then, um, you know, there's a lot to the song. It's kind of like a solo kind of thing. And there's, you know, mixing of the different parts. And it's a blues song. There's always variation. There's never – it's never played the same way twice. But – what I wanted to do was get down the recognizable parts. There's a main line that's just very recognizable. The intro is very recognizable to Killing Floor. And uh, then, you know, in, in common blues fashion, and I could, what I could do is play that same song and just put different lyrics on it and have a whole new song. Absolutely. You know? So the other thing I did this week was I put those Cobalt Strings by Ernie Ball on my Les Paul. Ah, uh, that's right. Yeah, uh, I was gonna. I'm gonna save the cobalt strings for the strat, and we can do our recordings. We've talked about to do some uh, tests to see if any new frequencies pop up in the sound by doing a spectral analysis of the sound. Since I'm a scientist, we can we can do that kind of cool stuff. Music meets physics. That's right. There we go. Uh, but I have to say, on the LP, I'm less than impressed with the strings. Really, like feel or sound. Uh, sound, both. Oh, okay. sound feels fine. I mean, I've heard people had problems with the feel of the strings. Honestly, I haven't re noticed that much difference. The sound, though, a friend of mine warned me that the sound was going to be brighter. Okay. And yeah, it's it's a little brighter, I think, than my tastes. Right. And I could definitely see people really liking these strings. I mean, it's all subjective. It's just a matter of, you know, what people individually prefer. Right. But for me, I think it's a bit too bright of a sound. Yeah. Yeah, I had that kind of experience uh, years ago when I was into uh, – I, I tried some stainless steel strings, which are not – probably not quite as bright as the cobalt ones, mm -hmm. but still brighter than your nickel-wound types, you know, because the wrap was stainless steel. And I, it was just bright, which with fuzz, it actually kind of – I don't know. For the real thrashy stuff, it was good. But any kind of bluesy or like turn it down, it really wasn't a good match. Yeah. So I can imagine that's kind of similar. Yeah, you know, I I have put, put a little fuzz on to play Inner Sandman. I'm still working on that song, working on the intro and stuff like that. And it sounded fine, I guess. But boy, when I'm playing Crossroads or or whatever, if I'm playing clean, it's it's not sounding what yeah. I like to hear. Kind of shrieky. Yeah. <laughs> but I bet they will sound awesome on a Tele or a Strat. Twang for days. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of what I'm thinking. So now my question is, you know, do I save my pack of nines that I have for my uh, uh, telly or do I put them on the Strat? Oh, decisions. Yeah. Tough call. <laughs> well, you could put them on the Strat. And I would think that if you do that and you like the sound there, 
then you should get another set and put them on a telly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. That's a good point. Well, and you know, talking about different types of strings, I have noticed uh, recently, I think it's Diodario. I believe that's how you pronounce that. Mm-hmm. Diodario. I'm not sure. Anyway, um, they have a steel string, I believe now too, the XLNY or something along those lines. Yeah. Might be interesting to grab a pack of those and just see. Sure. I also have, there's a sale at the store that I buy, um, like my strings and stuff at uh, a few months back. And so I just bought a whole bunch of strings that I normally wouldn't buy. I also have some um, uh, Ernie Ball uh, Slinky uh, right. strings as well. I never had those. I've pretty much only ever played, um, boy, what is it? Diodario and also Elixir. Mm-hmm. And yeah, they're not that different. I mean, they're, they're kind of a nickel wrap, I think. Yeah. Yeah. If, if I remember right. I mean, I've, I, I think I've, those were the strings that you could buy one at a time in a very small shop uh, years ago around here. And uh, and so those would be the ones that I would replace my <laughs> my other strings with because I don't want to put a whole new set on. And uh, ah, youth, you know. And uh, and they didn't sound very different. And they were nickel wrap. I think uh, D'Addario's I was using at the time. So, yeah, very good. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're decent strings. You do have to change them out a little bit more frequently than the elixirs. I do like the elixirs. Some people complain about the feel of elixirs. I guess because I started playing them so early in my guitar playing days that I haven't hasn't bothered me. Yeah, I like the elixirs a lot. I use the the nanos for uh, for electric, um, just because they seem to stay fresher longer. Yeah, and people say that they don't give you that real bright sproying in the first couple of days that you get with like other brands of new strings. Um, because there's like something in the wines right at the outset, but you know, for a couple of days, I'm not going to change my strings every week anyway. <laughs> so, right. So I'm good with that, and I like how they last. And the acoustic ones, I get the polywebs, which have the full, you know, Gore-Tex whatever in there, and they're a little odd because they they grow fur. Have you ever experienced that? <laughs> No. Yeah. So there's no, a lot. Yeah, of... actually, yeah, I have. I could have mentioned it. My my ES three thirty nine has got some fur on those strings. I was wondering about that. Especially the thinnest wound one. I mean, you can, it, because it frays away there where you pick it. Especially if you use a pick, um, and that's a little weird. Um, but on an acoustic guitar, especially, it really cuts down the the sliding finger noise. Which I know some people like that as sort of just one of the neat effects endemic to guitar playing. But I, I don't like it all that much <laughs> yeah. i like a little but not as much especially when recording as as you can get so yeah i can definitely i've i've noticed that sound uh a couple times on my electrics and uh depends on what i'm playing whether i like it or not yeah so out there in guitar land let us know what strings you like and, what, and what strings you absolutely d- detest whatever yeah Tweet us at SST Show. Uh, I'm also hoping to get a Facebook page up and going in the near future. Uh, let you guys know all about that. But as you do talk about strings, folks, let's keep it civil. Everybody loves their own types of strings. And just because someone likes a set of strings that you don't like doesn't make them less of a guitar player. So let's just keep it polite. All right. Um, so I guess um, moving on to our next topic, I thought uh, what we would do uh, and see how it works is talk about a Craigslist ad today, uh, not as the main show topic, but just something to discuss. And I found a ad at our local Craigslist for a telly for sale. And uh, the telly, what caught my attention uh, about the telly is that it's actually a build this person, uh, you know, did on their own. Uh, it looks uh-huh. like they put a fender, they put a, a, a MIM fender uh, maple neck on it. But it is a, a self-made guitar, and I thought Jesse, I'd start asking by asking you, um, what do you think about uh, buying a guitar that someone else built that's not a luthier? We're going to assume this person is not, you know, a luthier, has gone to luthery school, those kinds of things. Right. Well, that, it really kind of depends on the parts and 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 the parts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, Actually, you could get parts that are already sort of pre-drilled and pre-everything that the assembly is really not that hard. Usually the hardest part is the finishing, as you well know. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. Um, but if you get a body that's pre-finished, and it, this ad doesn't really say, um, but if you go and it's pre-finished, I mean, then most of the hard work is done. You pretty much just assemble it, and as long as you don't mess it up, you can be good to go. There are kit um, 
makers that, that have things that are pre-drilled and just fitted and they're, they're fine. Um, in this case though, the fender neck with the GFS body is, I don't know, uh, there's tolerances with, you know, uh, mating joints. And so I'm not sure how well that would fit. And so for something like that, I would probably want to see it, definitely play it, see if there's any dead spots on it, whatever, how it felt. Oh, I mean, sure. If you get an inexpensive guitar, even if it's the same quality level as these parts, I mean, there's still a quality assurance sort of process they go through. And plus, they were specifically designed to mate to that body. Right. So, but the parts all look pretty good. It's kind of weird. It's got a tone zone neck pickup on a Telecaster. And that's not what I'm familiar with. What's that about? Well, I don't have any experience with the small. It looks like a... Um, uh, humbucker in a single coil size in fact a small single coil size because it's the neck and a telly which is yeah. tiny i don't know how they pulled that off uh, but i've had full size tone zone pickups and it's kind of a wide range pickup so what the marzio does um is the coils on a typical humbucker are wound pretty much the same i mean there's variation especially in the older you know when people are winding them with like sewing machines spoolers and whatnot right but um they try to get them the same and so when the frequencies cancel you tend to get the same they, the coils pick up the same frequencies except for the fact that they're spaced a little different area under the string and so that's why you get some of the cancellation in the highs that you do with the humbucker giving you that sort of thick sound um, but a tone zone does, it, and many of the demarchers do this actually, have a patent on this, um, is they wind the coils differently. So one will pick up sort of more of a higher range, some pick, the other one will pick up a little more of a lower range, and they don't cancel quite so much. So you get kind of a wider range sound sort of. And it's a good sound. It was really good with fuzz. I mean, it's, <laughs> it gives you a nice, you know, good highs and good lows and, you know, maybe slightly sort of scooped sound. Um, but yeah, kind of neat, but weird on a Telecaster. Yeah. Yeah. That would be, I think a bit strange. And just for the people listening, um, that maybe don't have the web in front of them and followed our show notes link. It's basically a maple neck. It has, uh, the, basically the butterscotch blonde kind of, uh, classic telly look string through the body. I looked at the back of the guitar. Um, and I mean, it just, it looks like a telly. It's what you expect a telly to look like. That would yep. be butterscotch blonde with a black pick guard and a maple neck. Uh, if you've seen one, you've, you've seen them all, <laughs> uh, to be honest with you. Uh, how would you, uh, feel about, you know, you're, say you're cruising through Craigslist, looking at guitars. If you see something is a, someone that says, you know, selling my telly build, is that an immediate turn off for you? Or is it one of those things that actually piques your interest? Well, I'm not a big Telecaster fan, so maybe, well, that, maybe a tele, tele build wouldn't pique my interest. But if somebody said, hey, check out my build, I would take a look at it. You know, it wouldn't be a, a deal killer, except that I would have to play it, definitely. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. So like the eBay type of thing, that would be scary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Unless it was such a steal that you could part it out anyway, you know. I mean, Absolutely. For the price here, at three and a quarter, I mean, you could probably part it out for more than that. If you wanted to, of course, that's time. So, oh, absolutely, it's time and effort, and uh, you may not get all the pieces sold. Um, so there is that risk too, which is why we all have a pickup drawer. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. I you have a pickup drawer, so you can give me your old pickups that you don't like. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for me, uh, I would be because of my lack of experience. I would be very hesitant. I mean, absolutely, it would be something I would have to play before I buy if it's if I saw it. Someone had built this. Uh, if it was a, a luthier, a luthier shop, whatever the case may be, I would be a lot less hesitant to investigate, although the cost is probably a lot more than what this uh, person's charging for the telly. Sure. Uh, um, but, you know, I mean, if there are probably some really good hobbyists out there that build these things and do an excellent job. And like you said, these kits are not that difficult to put together. And when I put my telly together through the kit, like you said, the hardest thing was the finish. And... The next time I do one, if there is a next time I do one, I'm really going to have to sort of reevaluate how I do the finish because I, I screwed some things up. <laughs> well, the first kit is always like the learning experience. Yeah. So wait till you do your first refret, you know. Oh, yeah. I think <laughs> I will let the pros do I've, that. I've said that. I've never done a refret. I'm not doing that. Yeah. yeah, I was actually I was putting when I was putting the strings on my LP, um, 
yesterday, I was looking at my frets and then thinking, because you, know, you know, I play a thing a lot, and I, I steel wool them, clean them up a little bit, and I was thinking to myself, man, I will never ever refret this thing. I will definitely get this to someone who knows what the hell they're doing. Yeah. And there's definitely we should do a show in the future talking about, hey, when do you, when should you get your guitar service? We ought to do that in the future. It'll be a good uh, good show. What yeah. to look for, you know, those kinds of things. That is a good one. Yeah. All right. Well, let's go ahead and move on to uh, the main topic. Although I think we have uh, had two main topics already: this Craigslist ad and the uh, <laughs> and the strings discussion. Uh, I thought what we would do is spend a little bit of time tonight talking about how to buy a guitar because I'm sure we have a lot of beginners out there listening to us, and they have got their first kit guitar uh, that you know it's like a co- an amp guitar combo. It usually comes with a bag and maybe an extra pack of strings, a cable, that kind of thing. And you can drop around two fifty, maybe a little less, maybe a little more. And then after they play for a year or so, they decide, you know what, I kind of want to move up, and you know. I want to get the next guitar. And I wasn't there all that long ago. And as you know, I had a lot of questions because you helped me buy my, my uh, first re- quote unquote real guitar, if you will. It was fun. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, and so I thought we'd just give some advice to some new folks out there as to how to go about um, buying a guitar. And I thought the first thing that we would talk about is being realistic about what your budget is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's uh, that's going to be, I think, your first and most important limiting factor, and that's not a bad thing because, as we've said on the show before, you can get some high quality gu- guitars for under five hundred bucks. That's true. You know, uh, it's not going to be the Gibson Les Paul traditional with all the little fancy accoutrements and everything, and most of those things probably don't contribute to the actual sound the guitar makes anyway. Um, but you know, don't hesitate if you're out there looking for your first uh, guitar, you know, don't, don't shy away from something that says made in Indonesia, made in China, made Korea, because there's some really high quality stuff out there that you can get without breaking the bank. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's the stuff coming out of the, you know, um, places you mentioned, China and Indonesia is, is every bit as good as some of the American stuff was back in the seventies. And that's not the slam American stuff. Mm -hmm. It's just that there has been uh, quite a range of, quality levels over the years and low level back then was terrible low level now is playable right you know, and and it in some cases good you know so definitely um you can get some good stuff for not that much yeah that yamaha pacifica that i have that i got as my kit guitar it's a great little guitar yeah. i mean you know it's still fun to play Absolutely. uh robert's got it and one of these days i'm gonna get it back from him but <laughs> <laughs> trade, it. trade yeah. him his squire back once we're done mutilating it that's right that's right and you know uh the other thing i think that uh a new person should ask themselves is um what kind of sound are you they're trying to get and honestly that can take a while to figure out which is why i at least recommend waiting at least a year maybe even a little more before you sort of upgrade that kit guitar playing different things figuring out what it is uh you what sounds you want to make who do you want to sound like if you want to sound like somebody if you want to sound like yourself then great i we encourage that but what are you trying to sound like because if you want to do you know thrashing you might not want to necessarily get a semi hollow right <laughs> that's true uh but in turn if you want to play the blues then you know you may want to avoid one of those ibanez rg whatever the case may be of course i'm not saying you can't play the blues on those things because you absolutely can um but you know you think about the blues guys and who you might want to emulate or the women who play the blues they're typically not playing those guitars and that's a good point you know um do you want to emulate sounds that you like which is what you know 99 percent of us do at the outset Mm -hmm. You know, we want to sound like a certain person, so we get a guitar that's built sort of like whatever they play. Um, but then again, if you do use the Ibanez with active pickups and a Floyd Rose and you play the blues, well, then you're not going to sound like Clapton, you know. Right. And maybe that's what you actually want. I mean, so it's kind of hard to think about. It. There's there's a lot to, to go into that. But, yeah, it's a good point. Yeah. And so you're thinking about that and you're thinking about your budget, you know, think about growing into the guitar. You don't want to buy something, you, you know, I, and I would typically recommend to tie, sort of buy towards the top of your budget a little bit, something to grow into. Uh, if you can afford it, if you can't afford it, then, you know, stick to where you're comfortable. But if you can toward towards the higher end of your budget, um, give yourself something that you can grow into. Um, the other thing that we did when I went and bought my LP, which is my, like I said, my first quote unquote real guitar, play a lot of guitars. Yeah. Play a lot of different guitars. Don't come in with blinders on thinking, all right, I want to walk in and buy uh, a Les Paul. And 
I sort of did that with my first guitar, but as you know, I didn't necessarily walk right over to Gibson either. I was looking at that style because I already had the Strat style guitar. Right. And so I, I would recommend people play a lot, go into a, a store. In fact, maybe even for your first guitar, go into a big store that has lots of different guitars. You may not necessarily buy it from there, but just get your fingers on those guitars. Definitely. And I would say, too, um, some people are scared to play like um, higher end guitars. Like, mm -hmm. you know, OK, I have four hundred dollars to spend um, and they only look at four hundred dollar guitars. I would say that if you're looking for, say, a dual humbucker guitar, something like an SG or a Paul or whatever you like, um, and, but as you say, try a bunch of different things. Um, look at the ones that are, you know, a thousand dollars, twelve hundred. Even if you know darn well you're not going to be able to afford that, it does give you an idea of this is something to to aim for, and this is kind of the template that you're going to compare the four hundred dollar guitars to. Right. And what you might find is that sometimes. I mean, I found that some of the $400 guitars play every bit as well. Yep. You know, now they might cheap out on stuff like pickups, you know, which is fine. You can always, you can always upgrade those, can't you? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it's not that hard to do. No. So, um, so that's a, a good thing to do. And then, uh, and it's instructional, you know, you can see what kind of that guy kind of guitar should sound like or feel like. Oh, most definitely. And the other thing is like you mentioned, you, you'll find that many of these $400 guitars may play very much as well as the uh, $1,000 guitar or $200 guitar. The other thing that might do for you is if you do find that's the case, it will put your mind at ease. You won't have this little sort of voice in the back of your uh, mind saying, wow, what if I had just bought the $1,000 guitar? That's true. You know, and what you could find is, you know, if you, while you're shopping, you pick the thing up, you compare it right there with the, um, the $400 guitar. And if there's no noticeable difference to you, then you shouldn't regret walking out with that four hundred dollar guitar, right? Uh, and nor should you necessarily be like, well, the next thing I'm going to do immediately is buy a thousand dollar guitar. Whereas you might want to go ahead and have your next guitar, and there's always going to be another one. Uh, <laughs> that's, true. Uh, that's right. Once you get into it, you're in. And uh, you might find it, for example, is like, well, I could upgrade this uh, LP that I just bought, or I could go for something I don't have, like a semi hollow or whatever the case may be. Right? One of those little, you know, RGs with the pink, uh, the Floyd Rose. Uh, <laughs> So I was a Pink Floyd. Uh, yeah, right. Um, so now one of the things, too, that you should uh, I think you should be aware of is once you have played a few guitars uh, and you think you have found like the one, uh, it should speak to you. It should sound good. It should be comfortable. There are definitely some things you need to check. And some of them are less important than others. You know, for example, check the finish. Are there any dings in it? You know, you're not the first person who picked up this guitar, even if it's quote unquote brand new. It's in right. a store, Absolutely. right? And if there are dings in it, it's not necessarily a problem. You might be able to talk to the uh, shop down. Absolutely. It might not affect the playability of that guitar at all. You know, I, but, I, but in turn, I was at a, a guitar shop that will remain unnamed at one point, And um, I looked for a semi-hollow there. And there was a significant ding in it. In fact, the finish was cracked and there was part of the bare wood exposed underneath the headstock along that's, the neck that's not good yeah because there was a crack there and boy you just didn't know how deep that crack went and at the headstock there's a lot of tension there with the string right and so you know you you want to be careful however that aside um some of the more important things to look for i think you know you want to see if the, is the neck straight is it comfortable to play now if it's a little bow that's not a problem because you know you may have to do a little bit of truss rod adjustment or whatever but if it's twisted that's a problem. Right. And what's a good way, Jesse, to check the neck straightness? Well, the easy way is if you um, press down, a, without, if you don't have a straight edge with you, which you may not have in the guitar store, um, press the, the first string, uh, the high E down at the first fret and at a very high fret, depending on the number of frets on the guitar, um, you know, 15, 17, somewhere up there. And then see where the distance that's halfway between where you've pressed it down Usually there's a little bit of uh, space between the string. That means that there's a slight bow in the neck. That, that's called relief, which uh, allows the string to vibrate. Okay, not to get too technical, but if when a string vibrates, it doesn't vibrate on the ends, but it vibrates the most in the middle. So you have to have some sort of clearing space there so that it doesn't rattle on the frets. The secret is you need to make sure that that, that space, that amount, is the same on the high string as it is on the lowest string. 
if you have you know a good amount of space on one of them and no space at all and it's hitting the frets on the other one then your neck gets twisted and that's never going to adjust right um, it's probably best to have somebody along if that can uh, guide you through these kind of things and show you you know um, but a good guitar store will will help you with, with that as well yeah but i mean i think it, it always makes sense to bring in a third party who has no vested interest in what you're doing and True. in fact I mean, and that's one of the reasons why, other than you being my friend, is why I brought you for my first sort of quote-unquote real buy is because I didn't know what I was doing. And the other advantage to that as well is that, you know, if you are been playing for just a year, uh, you could give that to your more experienced friend and say, show me what this thing is supposed to sound like. <laughs> that's true. And so you can, as because you, if you think about growing into this guitar, you are going to get better. What does it sound like when somebody who is good plays it? Right. And, you know, do you still like that sound? And and that's it can be a, a factor. Uh, the other thing I'd recommend doing as well on top of that is to, if you go to a large enough store, they should have an amp that you have or one that's similar to it. You'd want to play um, the guitar through an amp like yours. If you can't bring your amp to the store with you, play it through a, uh, a similar amp that's in the store because that'll give you a sense of what it'll sound like at home. If you don't have a Marshall stack at home, don't play it through a Marshall stack in the store. Right. <laughs> you might be highly disappointed when you play it through your little six-inch practice amp. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And uh, at some point, we should probably do a show about how to buy amps as well. Um, but just keep that in mind if you're interested and you're thinking about buying guitar. Um, you know, play through an amp similar to what you have. Uh, it doesn't have to be the same, but similar. Of course, you could do what I've done in the past, too, and you decide, well, they don't have the amp that I have, so I'll play through this one and end up walking out with the amp, too. Yeah. Uh, but you know, that's always possible. One other thing, real quickly, when you're choosing guitars, is if you find one that you really like, um, it, it doesn't hurt to ask, hey, do you have another one of these in the back? Because yeah. if it's a larger guitar store, and it's probably not the case in a smaller store, but if you have a larger one, usually they'll have a few of, of a given model, especially if it's a popular one. And uh, and they shouldn't have any problem if you're looking at buying to uh, bring another model out so you can A, B, two of the same exact model because they may play a little differently. Or you may just like the finish better on one or what have you. But that's kind of a, kind of cool because you get, you know, the better one for the same price. Absolutely. And, you know, the truth of the matter is even with your factory mass-produced guitars, like you said, there is going to be variation from one guitar to the next. Oh, yeah. Wood is wood. <laughs> yep. It's all different. Absolutely. And so you might as well play several of the ones that you're interested in buying. I do have to say, though, there is another uh, large uh, store, uh, we'll, I'll go nameless, that uh, I have shopped at uh, buying new guitars. And I have asked them before, so do you have another one of these in the back? And I've always been told no. Yeah, sometimes they just don't want to bring them out. Or, or maybe they just don't have one. I mean, that's, they have, you know, they want to put them all out. Yeah, and I think in the case of the cracked finished 339, I bet that was the case because yeah. why would you not do that if you had clearly have someone who's there for a 339? It was the Epiphone 339. Um, you know, why would you not bring it out? Now, however, same not this well, same chain, not the same store. I went in for a Strat, pretty vanilla flavored Strat, and I asked, do "You have any more?" They told me no. So the question is, you know, is that the case or not? Maybe it was, maybe it's not. I don't know. But I think asking for multiple um, sort of versions of, if you will, of the guitar you're interested in is, is definitely a good idea. Yeah. Um, I think the the last point that I had in my mind, uh, and Jesse, feel free to add if. Uh, as we get through this, is uh, I think you want to think about what kind of store do you want to or have to shop at. Right. That's a good point. Um, pretty much you're looking at the difference between uh, having a, a lot of inventory, so a lot of things to choose from, and a smaller store, maybe some more personalized service, uh, yet not the selection that you might want. It's kind of hard, though, because even in a like a larger store, you'll see Fender and you'll see Gibson. You may see many of them, you know, the bigger brands. But it also may be that, you know, a smaller store will have just what you want. <laughs> especially, if, especially if it's not one of the huge popular, you know, three major guitars. <laughs> right, right. And, you know, that that's just it. You know, you could be exchanging, you know, um, choice for or variety for service. Right. But maybe not necessarily. Uh, but the smaller stores, they have a little bit more on the line. They definitely tend, not always, but they tend to 
to want to sort of step up with uh, customer service. Uh, the other thing too is, as you pointed out about the three major brands, and I mean, many of us are guilty of it, and I will first be the first to admit that I have certainly have been uh, before, maybe still am. Uh, don't pay too much attention to that headstock. Yeah, that's true. You know, it is just a decal. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm the king of buying cheap stuff that I like. <laughs> <laughs> and and I've kind of become the king of buying the name brand. Uh, and I know that, you know, I should definitely expand my horizons a little more than what I do. But, uh, you know, some of these bigger brands have been popular for a reason. That's true. You know, uh, but there are also those really good smaller brands that uh, they're just they're they're great guitars. Uh, and they just they are not as expensive because they're not giving so much money to Guitar World magazine, for example, to have advertisements or whatever the case may be. Um, and like and that, you know the front and the back of the headstock, back of the headstock, of course, is where it's made. Front of the headstock is who makes it. <laughs> and uh, just uh, you know, don't do, be a little headstock blind. You might be surprised what you'll come across. Yeah, really, it's all about the sound and the feel. I mean, the fact of the matter is that the cheaper um, makes. I'm not going to mention any names specifically, but um, you'll find that the cheaper lines of even the major brands, okay? I mean, you may have, well, maybe not Gibson, but Fender will, and some of the other brands will, uh, they contract guitars. So if it says made in Indonesia, then it's going to be made by the same people that have some no name or small name or whatever. And it may be a very similar guitar. I mean, there's tons of copies of, of the major types of guitars out there. And so, you know, I'm not against anybody who wants to just have you know, Fender or Rickenbacker or whatever it might be on the headstock. Um, but at a given price point, definitely play what's available that's like that sort of guitar and see what you like. I mean, sure. you, may, you may find that Epiphone or Gibson or Fender is exactly what you want. You may find that, I don't know, Sam's copy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, Mono Price does sell guitars. That's right. They, they have a couple out there. I've, I've been curious, you know, I, they're sub $200, I think the ones that I'm thinking of. And uh, boy, it's not much of an investment to drop two hundred bucks on. You know, they they do a j good job with cables. Sure. You know, uh, why not uh, give it a shot? So, all right. Anything else you'd like to add about how to buy a guitar, Jesse? Um, with somebody else's money. Yeah, that's always the best. <laughs> <laughs> that's always the best. Well. Uh, for those of you listening, if you have your, um, you know, favorite piece of guitar buying advice, please share it with us at SST Show uh, or email me at uh, Chris at JesterCat.com and I will share it with everyone uh, that I can. I know we certainly have missed things. Uh, it's impossible to give a thorough list of what you should do when buying a guitar because for everyone that is different. So... I will take us out of here. Until next time, everyone, remember, just keep picking and grinning. Six Strings and Things, a guitar adventure, is a production of Jester Cat Studios. You can see more about this and all other Jester Cat shows at JesterCat.com. You can also email the show at SST at JesterCat.com or continue the conversation on Twitter at SST Show. You can follow Robert at RS Macy, Jesse at Jester 700, and Chris at CW Culp. Thanks to Jesse for playing and recording our intro music. 